All right, all right, all right. Welcome, everybody. Another edition of Legend Sports and Amplify, and we're talking Negro League history and baseball history, card art collecting, uh, whatever your passion is about baseball. And I'm really happy to have on today Professor Courtney Smith of Cabrini University, uh, author, researcher, uh, done a lot of work on sports in Pennsylvania and Philadelphia. Welcome. How are you? Great. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, this will be a lot of fun, I, especially since you're a, a Philly sports fan. I mean, I was telling yeah. you, I, I grew up, I am. I will be a diehard Philly sports fan uh, forever. I mean, I'm not a fly-by-night. I, I went to Penn State, yeah. so I'm always a die. I mean, I live and breathe Penn State football, even down here in Texas since I've been here about 20 <laughs> years. Uh, it's it's not easy sometimes being a, a Pennsylvania sports fan. They they no. break your heart a, a lot, but um, it's it's really great to always talk to uh, another fellow Philly uh, sports fan. So uh, I was telling you a little bit about. Um, why I'm doing this and, and getting these stories out there and and I think the stories that you have written particularly the book on Ed Bolden is another another um, you know legendary Negro League figure that that maybe a lot of people don't know a lot about um, I also like to hear the people's origin stories that was something that Dr. Brunson gave me how you got into what you're doing I mean you're you're a professor of history and political science right at, at Cabrini yes yes so how did you get into writing stories about sports? Obviously, you're probably a sports fan, but yeah. particularly about the Negro Leagues and, and black baseball. So I, as you said, and like you, I'm a lifelong Philadelphia sports fan. I remember back in my childhood listening to Harry Callis and Whitey Ashburn right? call, you know, call games on television. It was just part of my summer. and. Uh, so I've been a fan of, of the Phillies, the Flyers, the Sixers, the Eagles for as long as I can remember. And then not only am I a, an employee, a professor at Cabrini University, I graduated from Cabrini, was then Cabrini College with a degree mm -hmm. in history and political science. And when I was at Cabrini as a student, my political science professor, Dr. James Headkey, along with a philosophy professor, Dr. Joseph Romano, got together and had this great idea for a new class called Baseball in the American Tradition. And it was the first time that they taught it, and I was in that first class of students that took it, and what it, it showed me is for the first time I could really combine two loves. Mm -hmm. I being you know, being a native of Delaware County, Pennsylvania, Philadelphia is just like twenty minutes away on a good day of driving. It's not that far away. So this this area is just so rich in American history. Mm -hmm. So I've always had a passion for American history and at a very early age, knew that that's what I was going to be one of my majors when I went to college. I chose political science as the other because it's it, the two uh, the two disciplines go together very nicely. And so when I took this class on baseball in the American tradition, I I learned for the first time that I could combine my loves. When I was in college, it coincided with 1997 and the then 50th anniversary of Jackie mm -hmm. Robinson breaking the color barrier. And so that was part of our discussions in the Baseball and American Tradition class. And, that, and I had known who Jackie Robinson was, but that was really the first time when I learned about the history behind Jackie Robinson, the, the history that Jackie Robinson brought into the game of baseball. It was the first time that I really heard about the Negro Leagues, those, those segregated leagues that existed when baseball followed the gentleman's agreement. Mm -hmm. And um, so I took that class and then I went on to grad school and for my master's thesis, I was told I needed to do some sort of original research and having that memory of the baseball and American tradition class, I decided let's let's see what I could do in baseball history as my master's thesis. And I realized that at that time there wasn't any research on the Philadelphia Stars. There had been some research on another team associated with this area. They were called the Hilldale Daisies, and mm -hmm. they were based in Darby, Pennsylvania, which is in Delaware County. But and this and Ed Bolden was the owner of of that franchise. But Ed Bolden then owned another franchise, the Philadelphia Stars, and no one had done any work on that. 
And being a sports fan, I knew it was a bit unusual for somebody to have two separate franchises in two different leagues and lead both of those franchises to the championships Mm -hmm. of their leagues. And so that's my origin story, being a native of the of the Pennsylvania of the Philadelphia region, being a native of Delaware County, being a lifelong sports fan, being a historian, and being somebody who just loves to combine the two and is very feel feels very fortunate that I've been able to combine those two loves. And so the writing part of this began in grad school and it's continued on now for almost 20 years. Um, with the book that I published a couple years, McFarland published a couple years ago about Ed Bolden. And then I'm currently involved in another project, a book project about the Philadelphia Stars, where I'll be contributing some, um, some articles and some chapters to that, uh, to that subject, to that book. Awesome. I, I, I hear you. I, I loved living in Northeast PA. I was maybe an hour a little bit up to Pennsylvania Turnpike from mm-hmm. uh, Philadelphia, and and I got kind of spoiled living there because, like you said, there's so much history all around you, but yes. it was just an, an hour, maybe a little bit better than an hour to get to Philadelphia, an hour and a half, two hours to New York City, it was four hours to Pittsburgh, it was three and a half, four hours to Boston, Baltimore was, you know, three hours away, Washington, D.C., there was so much history you could step on. Then I moved to Virginia for about seven years in the 90s and it was the same thing when I would make that trip to go back and visit my parents you're coming up through you're stepping on history everywhere you go every place is a a civil war battlefield a revolutionary war battlefield the first (laughs) colony the first this the first that it's just beautiful and and I I appreciate what you're doing and what many of these authors and researchers are doing is um, a lot of times you can take sports and use it as a window into other uh, aspects of society. And I, I think mm-hmm. that uh, that's something that maybe makes it more palatable for people, maybe. I, I, I don't know, you know. Sports is always kind of a, a little bit more innocuous way to yes. <laughs> maybe tell, <laughs> maybe tell a, a different story and get people to at least go, oh, I didn't know that. You know? No, absolutely. <laughs> little, like you mentioned about the Jackie Robinson story, there's so much of that mm-hmm. that it's more than just baseball. Uh, that right. ties into that. So, uh, so before we get into the the Philadelphia, t- tell me a little bit about what what was this uh, that you wrote? I, I got to hear what the wickedness and the holy experiment, <laughs> sports in colonial yeah. Philadelphia. What w- tell 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 us about that because it's it's got a great title. I can tell you. Yeah, and I took the title from something that I found during the research that sports were considered to be wicked and or a symbol of wickedness in colonial society and i guess if you ask some people sports today are still considered maybe wicked (laughs) in in american society i think the internet is more wicked but (laughs) (laughs) probably (laughs) yeah that was a great that was a great experience because most of my research doesn't necessarily go back to colonial times and so that was really a different kind of experience just doing the research into colonial sources as opposed to late 19th century and 20th century sources which are much more easier to find much more easier to read Um, but what i really enjoyed about that was colonial pencil colonial philadelphia really didn't have anything formal in terms of sports and yet people still played sports people were athletic benjamin franklin was athletic even though when you look at a portrait of him you don't think of oh that's an athletic that's an athlete Mm -hmm. but that they saw to them um to them, athletics was almost what we consider part of their daily lives, and that they saw it as kind of a leisure activity, but then it was also something that would be required of them because of the way that they just lived their lifestyles. And so there would be things that we would recognize today. There would be swimming, there would be ice skating, but then there would other be other forms of colonial sports where we would look at it and say that kind of looks maybe like baseball, but it's not how we would play baseball today, or that kind of looks like you're playing with a hula hoop, but that's not how we use a hula hoop. And so it it has a more expansive definition of what sports is. It's not necessarily competitive sports. It's not anything professional or formalized. Well, it might be something that we stay with term recreation, but if you do, if you do a trace from colonial pencil, from colonial Pennsylvania, colonial Philadelphia, and just the colonies in general, and you do a trace into now the early 21st century, you can see some evolution 
of these various games that colonial Americans played and said, oh, this kind of was the foundation for the professionalization of sports after around and after the Civil War, and then really for the true professionalization of what we see today in the organization that we see today in sports. And that's a great segue because baseball, that's how it started out. Baseball was just a leisure activity, and, and, and honestly, it was it was more for it wasn't for the working class, right? I mean, it was more right. for the uh, higher society, and it was a way to get out there and get a little sun, I would imagine, and 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 mingle with your uh, your other fellow, whatever it was they were doing. I imagine, I, I, from what I've read over the years, it's a lot of a lot of times they were businessmen, lawyers, uh, you know, higher higher. Mm-hmm. Uh, they weren't the regular working class. So baseball, yeah. and, and so you wouldn't even recognize baseball from its early roots to anything that it is today even even 50 years after the game had changed so much mm-hmm. from what it was uh but Philadelphia has had a uh a huge impact on the sporting world i mean there's, there's no no coincidence that i mean the east coast dominated um the number of teams and professional teams major and minor just because of the population centers and and the industrial centers and railroads and so forth. But Philadelphia had two teams. Um, Most people maybe know that. I don't know. (laughs) But, um, and and the Philadelphia Phillies, to me, I'm proud to be a Phillies fan. What always bugs me is they have the most losses of any professional baseball team. Well, yeah. (laughs) Well, yeah, because they've been around like they're they're the longest. Yeah, Yeah. they're they're the longest continuous, same city, same nickname team ever. So, yeah, Yeah. of course they have the most, you know, well, I wish they had more wins than losses, but they don't. Uh, Yeah, I mean, we do have that going for us, right? We've been around since 1883. We've been the Phillies. There was that one kind of odd time in the 40s where the owner tried to say, let's call ourselves the Blue Jays. Jays. Thankfully, that never took on. Although, if you go back, you can still see some memorabilia of the Blue Jay on a Phillies uniform, and it looks weird. I have. I have yeah. I have a uh, it's a Jimmy Fox jersey actually replica one that has the Blue Jay patch on the shoulder, uh, and people ask me if, whenever I do wear it, what is that? Exactly. <laughs> they realize, yeah, one season they, during World War II they were the Blue Jays. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah. But uh, now when it comes to Negro League history though, that same depth of uh, involvement and history goes way way back. I mean, uh, you know, the Pythians in the eighteen 18- 80s, I believe, maybe even the 1870s. Um, yeah, it goes. Um, the Civil War was as brutal and bloody as that conflict was, and ultimately necessary as that conflict was. The Civil War really gives a kickstart to the professionalization of baseball, mm-hmm. and the the development of black professional baseball parallels the development of of what becomes Major League Baseball. And in the 1860s, there were the Philadelphia Excelsiors and the Philadelphia Pythians. And when I was doing my work with Ed Bolden, I really tried to connect him to that history because the 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 Philadelphia Pythians had as their leader um, Octavius Caddo. And he was, again, a big civil rights activist. Mm -hmm. And... He was killed in 1871, or he was, you know, he was mur- he was murdered on election that really, day, wasn't it? Yeah, on election day, yeah. and it it ended that franchise. But prior to his murder, he really tried to be a leader through baseball and tried to use that and try to use the franchise to integrate what was then considered kind of not major league baseball, but kind of the forerunner to it, and they were mm-hmm. rejected. And so when you see the history of the Excelsiors and the Pythians, you really see at the beginning how that how black Americans um, during Reconstruction, this era, immediately after the Civil War, were already beginning to face discrimination Mm -hmm. in the sports world. And so that's the kind of that that was kind of the history that I uncovered and that again looking at this kind of tracing roots through time when you get to the the 20th century and to the development of separate negro leagues you can understand why those leagues existed because decades earlier black men were basically expelled or prevented even from getting into 
what was going to be minor league and then major league baseball. Hmm. Uh, interesting. And then um, you mentioned that I, I didn't even realize that. So now you fast forward from that time period to the forming of the D Hilldale Daisies, which, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know, I, you know much about them, but I do know that they started out as a, as a uh, young young men's club wasn't it or was it yeah. mi mixed they were, ki they was were it... kids when yeah. you look at some of the early team photos of them right after ed bolden joined he's not that old he's i think about 29 or 30 years old in the photograph they're kids they're, so he and, was and there you can right clearly see that they're he he was asked to hold he was asked to do um to keep score of one of their games and Ed Bolden had a, had a respectable job with the Philadelphia Post Office, so he was kind of a, a respected member of Darby society. And it really doesn't surprise me that they asked him to keep score of one of their games. And he then, from that point forward, made, made baseball his life. He still worked at the Philadelphia Post Office, was still very... Um, was still a very valid employee of the Philadelphia Post Office. And he managed, though, to also run the baseball franchises in addition to doing his job. And really, until the day he died in 1950, he was affiliated with professional baseball in some form or another. He turned, he and a group of other Black leaders in Darby took this Sandlot team of 10 and 11, 12 year old boys professionalized them in a few years and by the by the time the 1920s come along they become really mm -hmm. the premier black professional baseball team on the east coast mm -hmm. the the negro national league starts in 1920 mm -hmm. they were not a member of that they were still part of an eastern color league had not yet been formed yet Right. Uh, but they continued to play with many of the Eastern teams, like the uh, the Lincoln Giants and and uh, the mm -hmm. Baltimore Black Sox, several of those teams. Um, and then they they finally um, formed the Eastern Color League in 1924, right? Or was it 23? 23. 23. 23. And he had quite a bit of a hand in that too, as well, didn't he? Yes. And there is a very fierce rivalry between Ed Bolden and um, the person who ran the, the first Negro National League, Andrew Foster, and they just they just didn't get along with each other. And they similar had personalities, fierce, maybe. Yeah, they <laughs> they had a you know they had a fierce um, you know they had a fierce rivalry. I think Bolden didn't like the fact that what was considered the Western teams that were thinking Midwest teams like the Chicago American Giants that they um that they were interfering that they were kind of creeping into his territory he really uh. liked being an independent team because he could then keep all the profits he could set the schedule for his for the franchise so he joins he does join the the first edition of the nnl then he forms the ecl and really becomes the rival to the nnl and they're just there's just stories on top of stories about owners fighting with each other, stealing each other's players, trying to earn as much money as possible and not really following league rules all the time. So it, it was not it was not a place for the faint of heart running any one of these leagues. And it wasn't a place for the faint of heart to be an owner in black professional baseball in mm -hmm. the 20s, 30s and 40s, because it really was a battle for survival. There was limited capital to go around. And so the teams um, really try to grab every right. every bit of capital that they could, and so the the league structure was always a little bit um, unsettled, unlike what you saw in Major League Baseball with the American and National League. Mm -hmm. Now it's interesting, right? Because and that that's part of the things that the, the stories and that that perspective that I'm trying to hopefully get people to wrap their heads around because um, it was. It wasn't Major League Baseball. Um, there was the barnstorming aspect. The whole, you know, I mean, the whole reason for the existence of a Negro League was because they were unable to play Major League Baseball but simply because of the racism at the time and the color of their skin. They were good enough to play 
many of those players, mm -hmm. um, but they were not allowed to. So under those conditions, to be able to achieve what they did, I mean, I, I tell you what, it, it's a, an incredible story of perseverance and some, like you mentioned, you know, Ed Bolden and, and Rube Foster, two really strong-willed guys who were able yes. to keep on, keep on keeping on because there were many efforts over the years to try to organize uh, leagues. They just couldn't make it. And finally, in 1920, it, it, it stuck, um, you know, for several years. The Depression now mm -hmm. comes along and kind of, uh, you know, puts a damper on a lot of those things. But um, they did not face... Uh, you know, okay, a pandemic in 1919, 1918, mm -hmm. everybody faced that. But you know what? Major League Baseball teams didn't also have to deal with the racism and Jim Crow yeah. at the time, not just in baseball, but in society in general. Um, along comes the Depression. Same thing. Everyone had to deal with that. World War II. But again, in through all of that, now you layer on top of that all of the the, the effects of the inherent racism that was going on. It was not easy for these guys. Uh, you needed to have a pretty strong personality, I would imagine, to keep on keep on keeping on. So mm -hmm. so what was Ed Bolden's, um, how did he get, how did he reach this level? Because, um, you know, um, all of these guys, many of them, the owners, had some backgrounds in, uh, you know, I don't want to say, Oh uh, well, yeah, the numbers game and some other things. What was Ed Bolden's background? How did he come? How was he able to rise to that level to own not just like you pointed out, you know, but two teams in in right. Philadelphia? So with the with the Hilldale, he formed a corporation, and it was an all um, African American owned corporation, and so they were able to pool their resources in in that regard and that gave them and, and then when they pull in with gate receipts which is another reason why ed bolden wanted to remain independent and liked it because they got to keep the gate receipts and gate receipts were a very important part yes. of of uh the revenue for these teams and so he had a corporation to support him with hilldale with the hilldale baseball corporation then after about so in 1927 he had been doing this for um, for many years, and then in 1927, at the same time, actually, that Foster has a nervous breakdown, Bolden has a nervous breakdown. Now, Foster's was more wow. severe because because Foster never really recovered from it, and he died a few years later. Ed Bolden recovered, and then he he engages in what almost seems like self destructive behavior. That he moves, you know, he he takes. Um, Hildale wants them to be independent again. The ECL it goes out of business. There is another attempt at a league, an American Negro League, that never really gets off the ground. And then he has, uh, with the Great Depression hits, he worries about Hildale's finances, and so he wants to kind of take apart the corporation and ally with uh, somebody in Philadelphia who was a booking agent who also owned sporting goods, but who was white. And that falls apart. And so Bolden actually spends about a year kind of in the wilderness. And then he comes back in 1933 with Ed Bolden's Philadelphia Stars. And that was the official team name, Ed Bolden's Philadelphia Stars. When he comes back into black professional baseball in 1933, he again is independent. There is a new edition of the Negro National League. This one isn't run out of Chicago. It's run out of Pittsburgh with Gus Greenlee, who was associated mm -hmm. with the numbers game, who was also uh, who was also kind of a boxing promoter. And so that's where Gus Greenlee got the money for um, for his for his sports ventures. Ed Bolden tries to remain independent. He's also though closely working with Ed Gottlieb. Ed Gottlieb uh -huh. was a booking agent. He, you know, if people know of Ed Gottlieb, they probably know him more associated with the Philadelphia Warriors and with and with professional basketball. Prior to that, he was very heavily involved with um, with the Philadelphia Stars and with booking games, not just for the Stars but also for uh, for teams in an Eastern. Uh, along the East Coast, and he had like his territory. Another booking agent would have his territory, and that, of course, could create some battles. But when you talk about money and finances, that's where Ed Bolden would get that. 
he does not appear to have been associated with the numbers game. He may have been associated with the numbers game, but that evidence is not there. I know you were talking about uh, um, earlier, you were talking about kind of the history of this and the history of research on black professional baseball. I saw one uh, when I was doing research 20 years ago, one of the early books about this did label him as kind of a black gangster. I didn't come across that information. There were, again, there were people associated with the Negro National League in the 30s and 40s who were involved in the numbers game, who were openly involved in gambling. For Ed Bolden, it looks like he did his work at the Philadelphia Post Office's work with the stars try to collect as much gate receipts as possible. But it also seems like that his alliance with Ed Gottlieb and Ed Gottlieb's resources in booking games, not just for the stars, but for other teams. And then Ed Gottlieb was involved with basketball before the NBA ever comes into existence. That's how the finances for the stars worked. Much of the much of that kind of archival information that would be really helpful today is unfortunately no longer available because mm -hmm. I know that I've asked for it, other people have asked for it, and it, there's just kind of very limited amount of archival information for the stars. And so for anybody interested in doing this, um, it can be a little frustrating doing research at this time because there just wasn't much, much information available. But that's how Ed Bolden made a name for himself. He also stayed very close to people who worked for the Philadelphia Tribune, which was the Philadelphia region's largest black newspaper. And the Philadelphia Tribune has just a treasure trove of photographs, ah. of, of articles, of box scores. Um, you know, God bless the people that have gone through all those box scores and and put that together for baseball research because those box scores are very hard to look at today because they're the kind of the newspaper quality is fading but then there's just so many of them and they're kind of thrown all over the sports pages because they published once a week so god ah. bless the people who did that but that's another way that ed bolden just got his name out he uh, you know he would invite dignitaries from Philadelphia, he would invite dignitaries uh -huh. from the Philadelphia Inquirer to be at the, you know, to be at the ballpark for opening day. So he really made a name for himself in that way. Um, in terms of his finances, he lived in Darby, Pennsylvania. He lived, it seemed like, in the, the same house that he lived in when he owned and operated Hilldale. Um, and you know, it was his, it was his address on the stationery. For the for the stars that I saw, so cool. he just he lived a, a he lived what appeared to be a modest life in Darby, but he also lived a pretty extraordinary life when mm -hmm. you look at at the time period and when you look at what he accomplished um, in the in the sport of baseball. And it's interesting what you what you just mentioned too about maybe there is a history of this or that in his background. When you look at who had the keys to the kingdom. <laughs> through all this time, right? I mean, we, we know recently uh, Kenneth Mountain-Landis' name was taken off the MVP award because right. of that, you know, connection to keeping the color line intact. But, you know, even something like J.G. Uh, Taylor Spink with, uh, with the Sporting News, you know, that was the Bible for the coverage of, of the sport of baseball for many, mm -hmm. many decades, still, you know, still is significant. And yet they often would either not portray uh, black or Negro League, you know, stars, even Jackie Robinson when he finally broke the color barrier. Uh, and so that's why his name is now off the Baseball Writers Association Award. So, you know, it, it's some, like you said, sometimes these stories, uh, what slant, who was writing them, what, what you know, you, you've got to really do a lot of due diligence on a lot of this stuff because everybody, I'm sure, has an agenda, right? Yeah. So. So Ed Bolden, he didn't just put together teams. I mean, he put together the first Eastern Colored League pennant winner in, in, in right. the first, you know, Colored World Series, which is an incredible event, which I'm sure Rube Foster loved the fact that he wasn't involved in it. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. Kansas City played Hilldale in that first, uh, you know, uh, exactly. World Series. Yeah. But, man, look at the talent that has been on his teams. I mean, that Hilldale team had uh, a number of, of Hall of Famers. They had... Uh, 
Louis Santop, uh, Judy Johnson, Biz Mackey, Tank Carr. I mean, that was a talented, talented team. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, he's out of it for a few years. He comes back with the with the stars, and he's able to produce another team full of, you know, uh, I mean, many of the same players, several of the same players. But you know, Judd Wilson, Dick Lundy, Biz Mackey. I mean, there were a number of. I mean, we're talking Hall of Famers here. Uh, he, yeah. he, he knew how to handle uh, and put together any new talent. Um, and so that's something that, like I said, I don't think a lot of people even know who Ed Bolden is. I have no idea. But he is definitely a pioneer uh, in this game that people should know about. And there's, there's uh, uh, a number of guys like that that hopefully your books and stories like this start to shine a light on on this. <clears throat> So when does the stars last until the 50s, right? I mean, they make it past even Jackie Robinson. Yeah. So the really the I would say the league organization of the Negro Leagues begins to fall apart in in the years after Jackie Robinson debuts with the Dodgers. And 19 so Jackie Robinson signs with the Dodgers October 1945. He plays for the Montreal Royals in 1946. 1946 was a pretty, still pretty good year mm -hmm. for the Negro National League and the Negro American League. There was a, a good deal of interest in the players because of uh, sparked by Jackie Robinson signing. 1947 comes along, and it seems like the intention of the entire baseball world goes to the Brooklyn Dodgers for good reason. This is a, this is history unfolding. Um, to me, the you know, Jackie Robinson is the most significant athlete of the 20th century in the United States, not because of his accomplishments on the field, but because of what his donning the Brooklyn Dodgers jersey number 42, what that meant for American society um, beyond, beyond the sport of baseball. Mm -hmm. For teams, though, like the Philadelphia Stars, it was the beginning of the end because as Jackie Robinson proves conclusively that black players can play in the major leagues and then as more players join him beginning with Larry Doby and then others in both minor and major league systems the attention from the from the Negro Leagues begins to wane mm -hmm. and for many players and for even many former fans the Negro Leagues existed because of segregation. Mm -hmm. The goal was to get a player into the major leagues. The goal was integration. Once that goal was established, Boy. what was the purpose of the of the Negro Leagues anymore? Mm -hmm. Because um, Ed, some of the owners kind of saw saw it coming, and the owners weren't necessarily in favor of having their players try mm -hmm. out for the Red Sox or the Yankees or the Phillies. Most of them got nothing out of that if they did, right? Yeah, they got nothing <laughs> yeah. out of it. And and they, I think the owners realized, well, if players are going to major league organizations, they're not going to come here. Mm -hmm. So Ed Bolden, I think somewhat naively Boy. thought, oh, no, we'll still be able to develop them because where else are you going to develop black players? Not realizing that with um, you know Branch Rickey really developing a minor league farm system for the St. Louis Cardinals and the Cardinals having so much success with that other major league franchises were going to adopt that mm -hmm. and and the you know and what he saw firsthand what other what other owners in the Negro League saw is it seemed like there just wasn't a place anymore for their teams for their leagues in an integrated baseball world mm -hmm. and so franchises like the newark eagles just they just stopped operating because they said it's not going to be worth it anymore the stars were one of the, the few teams that did try to play on not just um past jackie robinson's debut but then also past kind of this flourishing of more black players going into major league baseball ed bolden dies in 1950 um so that ends, you know, that ends his time, but his name lives on with the stars. Then, um, then the, you know, Ed Gottlieb continues to run the team. Oscar Charleston, who was the field manager for the stars, he helps, 
he kind of he doesn't quite fit the Ed Bolden role, but he does help Ed Gottlieb run the team. There was um, some there was some discussion that maybe Ed Bolden's daughter Hilda would be mm-hmm. involved with the franchise. Doesn't seem like she ever was. They play 1951, 1952. They don't have a home ballpark anymore because the home ballpark that they had used was a Philadelphia railroad station located at 44th and Spruce. It was, it was 44th and Spruce, or for, no, sorry, 44th and Parkside in West Philadelphia. And it just, it was so rotten um, after the World War II that it just was not, it, it was not usable anymore. So the only field that they really had to use for their home games was Shy Park, mm-hmm. um, later known as Connie Mack Stadium. But in the 1940s, they already had two teams there. They mm-hmm. had the they had the Phillies and they had the A's. A's yeah. So they really, in their final years, the Stars still had Philadelphia on their jerseys, but they really were like a traveling team. They they wouldn't play their first home game until well into the season. So they kind of lost touch with their Philadelphia fans. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, the players became progressively younger because players who really intended to be you know, major league ready in a few years would just go right into minor league farm systems. Mm-hmm. There was no, there really was no uh, point to going to a Negro league team first. So the stars yeah. close up the 1952 season. Then 1953 comes along. Ed Gottlieb makes the, the decision before the season even starts that we're just not going to field a team this year. We'll reevaluate later. Never happens. So mm-hmm. they just they just play their last game and no fanfare. That was it. Mm-hmm. Boy, you know, I'll tell you what, that's the one the one conversation. um that I would love to have been, you know, privy to back in these days because they all had to know, you know, fans of um, the Negro Leagues, black baseball, black fans wanted integration. And then once it happened, they weren't following the Negro Leagues like they that they were. They were following, they wanted to see how was Jackie going to do, how was Larry Doby, how was all these guys going to do. Yeah the black press did the same thing. And yes. so, you know, I, I, I had on um, Rob Ruck, Professor Ruck on a few weeks ago. And one of the things that he, you know, did a lot of research on, and he's over at University of Pittsburgh, kind of like your contemporary over there, but uh, he, he did a, a thesis one time on the impact um, on the Negro League, what integration did to black society in general. Uh, and it wasn't all positive. I mean, it it, it, it yeah. really, I mean, it, it was a, um, a, you know, a little more devastating because think of the money that was involved with that. I mean, it was one of the larger uh, enterprises uh, next to like, I think, uh, you know, what, insurance and <laughs> was something else, right? When it came to black owned businesses. So it's a huge impact that uh, once they began to fail, um, on on uh, these teams and and as an owner i would love to have known those conversations because they had to know it was coming that yeah. it, that eventually it was not going to be sustainable um yeah interesting that ed bolden was still you know trying to uh keep it mm-hmm. afloat yeah. yeah interesting you make it you make a good point about the newspaper coverage because I, when I was doing research, I noticed that when I was looking in the Tribune, it was like the Phillies and the A's didn't exist. Mm-hmm. And then when I was reading things like the Inquirer and other white newspapers, it was like the stars didn't exist. There really was <laughs> just this kind of separate, Echo segregated chamber, yeah. world. Yeah. But then suddenly when Jackie Robinson debuts, there is an advertisement in the Tribune for come into town, you know, come see Jackie Robinson and the Phillies in, in little and like kind of smaller letters come see Jackie Robinson at Shy Park. And then a few months later, when Larry Doby debuts with the Cleveland Indians, okay, come back to Shy Park and see Larry Doby when he <laughs> plays against the A's. Yes. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, I, I try to do a little bit of uh, amateur, you know, 
historian sleuthing on on some of these <laughs> and and I'll tell you what there is a lot of really really interesting articles I try to post something new something on Twitter every single day that I, I think people probably have never seen some newspaper clipping you find some great ones out there they you know people think that the Negro Leagues were uh, and, and I know it's because they wanted they want to see these <clears throat> nice hundred and 62 game schedules and mm -hmm. playing and statistics and league leaders and whatnot right <clears throat> and it wasn't that way yeah. and it wasn't that way for a lot of reasons i mean they made a lot of money barnstorming you know right off the bat but but um the coverage in the black newspapers of the day through the 20s 30s and 40s was pretty darn good i mean it was really good i mean right down to play-by-plays in, in many of them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the Pittsburgh Courier obviously was, you know, one of the best, the Chicago Defender, uh, Baltimore, I think it was the Baltimore Sun, I think was another one that covered it as well. Uh, there was some, you, there would be, some, there's some great, uh, you can find some great insights in, but it is interesting, like you just pointed out, that, yeah, the headlines in those newspapers tended to be uh, following the Negro Leagues. But then once Jackie came, that all kind of changed so yeah. yeah it's interesting so um how long so ed bolden when was his last years with the team when when did he eventually um so the team lasts into the 50s was he was not there anymore though right? no he passed away in 1950 so you mentioned that it was his daughter that they thought you thought it, there was a couple newspaper articles that uh his daughter was interested in continuing it and then when Ed Gottlieb um, made the decision that he didn't he didn't want to field a team this year, there was some talk that maybe Hilda Bolden would find somebody else to field the team and keep Ed Bolden's Philadelphia Stars alive again, but that never happened. And so they didn't field a team at all in 1953. And then, and then really the sports world moved on. Mm -hmm. the The Philadelphia Tribune moved on to cover other sports in 1953. And there's there's just really nothing, nothing really more about them until you get to more recent times and people doing research that you really get a kind of a reawakening of, oh, the stars were here. They played for, you know, they played for 20 years. Um, they you know, they were really kind of in the middle um, of all these different developments in the Negro National League. And then they were there when major league baseball integrated and so if you take a trace through their through their time period through their history you can see kind of the the highs and the lows of black professional baseball in the 30s 40s and early 50s mm -hmm. and it's interesting right? we mentioned about the philadelphia phillies being that long of a running same city same team uh black baseball history negro league baseball history in philadelphia is pretty darn long i mean it goes back you, you're talking about that's 80 years at least yeah if you're talking from the 1870s all the way to uh the um 1860s even all the way to, yeah. to the 1950s so you're talking 80 90 years of history and significant history uh very very interesting mm -hmm. stuff I, I hope people uh check it out um what Real quick, I know it's it's not nothing to do with Ed Bolden, but tell tell people what um, we talked about. Octavius Caddo, he has a statue now in Philadelphia, and a lot of people that I knew that I still keep in touch with were like, "Who's this guy? And why is there a statue?" Can you can you, can you tell us anything about him? Yeah, he's probably I. My guess is he's probably better known as a civil rights activist mm -hmm. than as a baseball entrepreneur, but he tried to do both. And I think to appreciate Caddo's story and significance, it's important to understand what life was like in the 1860s immediately mm -hmm. after the Civil War. So Civil War is fought over the institution of slavery and the civil war eradicates the practice of slavery leads to three constitutional amendments one of which the 15th amendment granted men like Caddo the ability to vote but not mm -hmm. everybody even in a northern city like philadelphia really embraced that that outcome of the civil war of slavery ending and then the idea, well, if African Americans, Black Americans are no longer enslaved, that means they're equal. 
that was the part that people in America had a very hard time embracing the mm-hmm. idea that black Americans would be equal as equal American citizens as stated in the 14th Amendment ratified in 1868. So Caddo is part of that time period and he's part of that time period that is really trying to push the boundaries of what it means to be an American in the aftermath of the Civil War in an era in which for the first time in the United States, slavery no longer exists. Mm -hmm. Caddo was, again, he was a civil rights activist. He brought some of that activism into baseball and his goal as goals of many civil rights activists were in the 1860s and into the early 1870s was voting. Just, just that, that <laughs> simple idea of going to a polling place and being able to cast a ballot. And he was killed because of that. Mm-hmm. He was killed because of that, because of the resistance to the idea that Caddo, a black man, was equal to other men and therefore had the ability to vote. Mm-hmm. You know, and why I bring that up is because now I look at, now you fast forward to today and you hear people saying, just dribble the ball you're not supposed to be involved in that stuff no sports has always been an area that people have used to do everything from advertise their products (laughs) to advocate for this or that whether it be voting rights or or uh whatever it may be and and so no no if an athlete has the the bully pulpit for a little while and he, they want to make a statement why not i mean that's, yeah. it, it's not something new this is not something new today this has been going on for a long 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 time so i just thought it was interesting and mm-hmm. when people ask me about him um you know i knew the story about him because i i a, a civil war you know growing up up there like i mentioned in the northeast i mean it was all around you um and so I knew the story of him, but uh, many people do not, just like they don't know the story of Ed Bolden or the Philadelphia Stars or the Hilldale Daisies or many, many pieces of history that just uh, more people need to to find out about. That's for mm-hmm. sure. So uh, you you touched a little bit on what you're working on next, but what what, what do you got? What do you got plans for? You're still going to keep concentrating on Philadelphia sports history. Yes, and right now I'm in the process of working with a couple of authors on a kind of anthology um, about the Philadelphia Stars. So I'll be contributing about an article about their general history and then a couple of other key parts um, of what they've they've done, uh, what I covered in the book. I also just recently wrote a book about Jackie Robinson and his significance in, um, in American sports history. And that's kind of like a, a bit of a textbook about Jackie Robinson because it has some primary documents with it. And um, yeah, so I'm, I, I like to do local history because I, to me, that's relatable history. And I think that if people understood the history of their areas, they might feel a deeper connection to them. So I like doing, um, like doing local history, like doing sports history. So that remains my focus for now um but yeah for the for the foreseeable future that's what i intend to continue to do i had uh dr leslie hefe on a few uh, months back as well and uh we talked about her work with the negro leagues similar to a lot of the things that you've done um but she also has that great book on women's baseball history, mm-hmm. which uh, a lot of that is in Philadelphia as well, you know, with, with the Dolly Vardens and, and several yeah. other teams, women's teams that go back into the 1880s, at least the 1880s. So, I mean, so much is out there. And I, I really I encourage people to look around them. I mean, so many stories I've come across and just talking to people where um, a lot of it, they didn't even realize it was in their own backyard. I mean, Hinchcliffe Stadium in New Jersey, I was talking to someone on here a few months back, and um, they didn't even realize, you know, here, it was at a park, there's a waterfall mm-hmm. there, and, and they, it was very nice to go to, but they're like, they never knew what that stadium was. And then when they realized, and now it's being renovated, um, there's a lot of history in that stadium it's it's everywhere it's all around you and and um you know i hope people uh, it, it's too bad that some of these stadiums are have long gone to the dust yeah. the dust because uh, there's not many of them left it's too bad i mean i i had gary gillette on a few weeks ago talking about his efforts with 
Hamtramck Stadium Hamtramck. I've in been Detroit. There. Yeah. yeah, I would love to, I would love to go check it out. There's still Rickwood Field in Birmingham. There's still several of them around Hinchcliffe in New Jersey. Uh, it would be very nice to be able to go uh, and check out. There's even the Jack the Stadium in Jacksonville. There's a stadium, uh, Negro League Stadium in Jacksonville uh, that has roots that go back a long, long way into the, I want to say at least the 1920s or 30s. Um, that the there's a little museum in Jacksonville um, for the Negro Leagues. So it's there. People just, if you just took the time to uh, to, 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 to find it, and and these kinds of stories that you've written and you're researching are important. Have you gotten any of your students interested in any of this? Yes. Yes, I, I've taught Good. a couple classes of, related to this, um, and so they are, you know, they are, I've gotten some people interested in it, yeah. And you think that they're going to uh, take the next step and get, in, get involved doing any kind of... Uh... <laughs> Who knows, but they were interested, so yeah, so hopefully that does, um, that they do take it in a direction, like where they can be maybe historic preservationists or where even yeah. they just do it as kind of a hobby or a passion. Um, but yeah, I've gotten a couple students interested in that. Yeah, I mean, I, I know um, as a teacher, you're probably trying to always find new and creative ways to <laughs> whatever it is <laughs> yeah. to spark some interest. And I do think sports has a lot of uh, the ability to do that because it seems mm -hmm. it's um, innocence enough <laughs> that people yeah. will, uh, but yet you can approach a lot of other topics, whether it be civil rights and voting rights, whatever uh, the case may be. So, uh, but I, I appreciate you taking the time. You got anything else uh, on your mind? Oh, you wanted to, you know what? So yeah, before you leave, Philly fans are fickle as they come, right? And we throw snowballs at, that, yeah. We throw yeah. snowballs we're, we're at like, Santa, we like, do all that, right? No, they're either really high or really low. There's really no boy, in between oh boy, or just yeah. like, oh, just going with the flow, yeah. So the Phillies, a couple of weeks ago, people were writing them off for dead. Um, and there's been some injuries, but everybody goes through injuries. I mean, uh, Acuna, Acuna with the Braves. I mean, there's been a lot of big guys, names that have been injured. Um, you know, um, uh, the Mets have had their share of injuries. Uh, yeah. And then they go on this little winning streak, and everybody's ready to put them in the World Series again. And now they lose two straight to the Dodgers, and all I'm reading now is about <laughs> how stick a fork in them, they're done. Yeah. What, do you, what do you think the Phillies are, <laughs> what do you think the Phillies are gonna do? I think that they they have a chance in the National League East because if you look at the standings, none of the teams have really broken away. A couple of the teams have fallen off. Like the Nationals have pretty much just closed up and said, we're going to just try again next year. Hmm. The Marlins are, are trending toward the bottom as well. But then you've got the three other teams kind of bunched together, the Mets, the Phillies, and the, the Braves. And the Mets have their share of injuries with Jacob deGrom, who might – come back in September, uh, who knows? And he has a kind of injury that seems like it's lingering, so that's not good news for them. Mm -hmm. They also have some other injuries too. The Phillies have some injuries uh, with you know, Zach Eflin. Reese on Hoskins the, is out On now. the IL, Reese Hoskins yeah. is, is out. So hopefully they Reece, can get JT, back. JT just took yeah. a ball off his noggin yeah, yesterday. Yeah, hopefully, <laughs> but he doesn't have a concussion, so he should be good to go maybe on Friday. Um, but yeah, it's, I have no idea. This is the strangest season because I watch the Phillies. I've watched every game and I look at them and I say, I just see so many holes. Mm -hmm. But then I look at the other teams in the National League East and I think none of these why teams are really the that. Yeah, why yeah. not them? <laughs> but you know, once they get to the playoffs, they probably will lose to to somebody in the National League West. I just hope it's not Gabe Kapler and the Giants because mm. that... I, you know, I have, I have issues with Cave Kapler since he was the, the Phillies manager, mm -hmm. but why not the Phillies? Mm -hmm. They, they're there if they can stay close for the rest of the season. They have the maybe, easiest, uh, the easiest strength of schedule going. Mm -hmm. They have the easier, easier strength of schedule going down this stretch as well. They got some games coming up against the Braves here in a little bit. I think that's going to be yes. telling. Uh, but again, people can't freak out. You know, if they go ahead and they, they get swept by the Braves, that'd be bad. But if they lose the series to the Braves and they fall behind, don't panic yet. It, it's still, there's still 50 games or so to go. I mean, uh, it, 
the baseball is a marathon. It's not this sprint, no one week. You know, know. It, it, it can be telling now and then, but I mean, um, and certainly don't want to have it happen, you know, mid-September, but because they, they did have that happen to them back in, uh, what year was that, 1960-something under... Uh, 64. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it, it can happen, but I mean, um, you know, you just got to keep the faith, right? As a Philly sports fan, and if it doesn't work out, you know what? Next year, we try again. <laughs> yeah, that's all. Wow. You, that's, all <laughs> that's all you can do, right? Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. This was a lot of fun. I appreciate you taking Thank the you. time. And, no and problem. It's great. Any time that you want to come on here, talk uh, Philly, anything, sports. Any anytime you got something that you're uh, working on down the road, uh, uh, keep in touch, and uh, we'll get you on here again. All right. Thank you so much for this. This was great. Thank all right. You. Thanks, Courtney. You have a good one. You too. Bye bye. Bye bye.